Well, after evading capture for an entire summer, the most notorious sea creature along California's coastline made a splashy return recently. Carter Evans went on a quest to spot the otter like no other. These are the latest mugshots of Otter 841, America's most wanted marine mammal. Last summer, she terrorized surfers in Santa Cruz, California, biting boards, even hijacking them. Now she's back, and surfers are on the lookout. Are people excited to see this otter? I think they're excited to see it first, and then they kind of get scared. <laughs> in an effort to do a deep dive, we hit the water. She's been sighted at surf spots like this, but so far, no outlaw otters. When I saw her, she was just feeding. Yeah. Real close to the cliffs. Photographer Mark Woodward snapped the latest pictures of 841, the number on her tag, over the Memorial Day weekend. And she was being very respectful of the surfers. He also captured the images of otter mania that went viral last year when crowds tried to get too close. So with paddleboarders and kayakers going right through the middle of kelp beds where sea otters sleep, it's dangerous. It's yeah. also illegal. Concerned someone could get hurt, the Department of Fish and Wildlife set up a dragnet operation. It failed every time. Eventually, the ornery otter disappeared, but in October made a surprising return with her pup. Experts now think pregnancy may explain her aggressive behavior. What would you like to see happen here? I hope she could be left alone. She lives her best life. Hopefully, she will refrain from getting on the boards, but who knows? We may just find out the next time the otter pops back up. For CBS Saturday Morning, Carter Evans, Santa Cruz, California. Don't mess with a mama. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really, some nice writing in there by Carter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our resident surf course. Whatever, right, yes. whatever you can do to get on that board. <laughs> Otter 841. I hope she gets to live her best life there. Carter Evans introduces us to this California surfing legend. Here we go. Oh, yes. Surfing a wave this size takes skill. Oh, she made it. Even people on the beach sound shocked. I think she's going to connect, dude. That's a dog tearing it up in a good way. That's because Skylar the surf dog is a beast on the board. She surfs legit waves, like yeah. real waves. She surfs some pretty big waves. Head high for you or me. Yeah. Probably caught like 10 footers before. Ooh, Skylar! Homer Hennard says he could tell Skylar had skills the first time he brought her to the beach as a pup. She ran and jumped on the board. I seen she had really good balance, and I was like, oh, it's on. Come on, girl. Come on. We hit the water in Santa Cruz, California, to see for ourselves. Sharing a wave together, it's obvious this furry phenom has flow. Skylar's earned the title of top dog for her canine gnarliness, but what stands out is her ability to surf solo. She was naturally leaning on rail and punching bottom turns and lifting up one paw to go this way. And, and it was like, she really got it. Like she was really surfing. Eventually, she was ready for the holy grail of surfing. They rounded up a barrel for this cattle dog at Kelly Slater's surf ranch. We came out of the tube and it was just, it was amazing. I can't even explain it. And she was looking back at me and I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> now at 15, Skylar's surf sessions are Primarily surf therapy. Yeah, doggy. Are you doing Helping people overcome challenges by riding waves. And just this amazing thing happens, you know, where they're just smiling. I almost can see disabilities go away for a brief moment. She looks like she's loving it. How do you know she's actually having fun? How do you know she likes this? Um, you can tell. Once we're riding a wave and she's hanging 10 on the nose with her tongue out, looking back up at me. She's been the best surf partner I could ever have. Who knew a salty dog could be so sweet? For CBS Saturday Morning, Carter Evans, Santa Cruz, California. What's a good baby girl? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> how awesome is that? I, I mean, mean, she looks like she's having fun. <laughs> I was gonna ask the ultimate dog show. owner if she looks like she's having well, fun. I think yeah. what he said is right. You know your animal. She looks you know chill. your dog, yeah. and yeah. you know when they're happy, when they're looking at you and making that eye contact. Yeah. But I love that she's also doing it with others, yeah. with people with disabilities that totally. they're helping get out there. So cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. I wish she was in the Olympics. And that lay.
<laughs> it was everything. That's the right. Pink lay. The pink. Yeah. She's got her Barbie pink on. <laughs> if you've ever visited Key West, Florida, you'll find there's never a dull moment. The nation's southernmost point is known for its white, sandy beaches, tropical sunsets, and boisterous nightlife. But as Christian Benavides found out, there's also never a quiet moment thanks to some unwanted guests who rule the roost. In quirky Key West, Florida, it's not just tourists flocking to town. Uh, oh yeah, he knows that I'm not a fan. Feral chickens have found their tropical paradise. <laughs> and city commissioner Clayton Lopez has got beef. Where are the chickens? Everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> Entire chicken families are crossing roads. This is not bad, just one chicken. <laughs> A resolution by Lopez, now law, bans feeding chickens in public property. What I am looking to do is to try and address uh, the health issues of, the, of humans, as well as the chickens. Droppings can spread disease. There's property damage. Chickens are run over by cars. Chicks fall into storm drains. And roosters crow at all hours. <laughs> Rescued chickens are sent to farms in mainland Florida, but it's impossible to catch them all. How did it get like this? It's the oldest image we have of chickens in Key West. Key West historian Corey Malcolm tells the tale of the tail feathers. Chickens were very much a part of early Key West. Brought in the 1820s by the first settlers. The tradition of raising chickens carries on, you know, from the early 1900s into around the World War II. By then, the ease of getting eggs and meat at supermarkets meant homeowners let their chickens loose in a two by four mile island with no natural predators. Mitigation has failed. A city employed chicken catcher in the 2000s quit after swift backlash from chicken enthusiasts. Here chickens are as much a tourist attraction as the southernmost point. They're also a popular site in souvenir shops. Arthur Bacala owns three chicken themed shops in Key West. They're everywhere. Yes, that's good for me, for funky chicken owner. We met him in his chicken themed wine and coffee bar. There's statues, paintings, t-shirts, mugs, and everything in between. It's part of the island's chicken culture, where it's the chicken's world. We are just living in it. For CBS Saturday Morning, Cristian Benavides, <laughs> Key West, Florida. The ah. chicken, the chicken catcher quits right. <laughs> after backlash from chicken enthusiasts. How is it possible that Ernest Hemingway's cats have not gotten a hold of all those chickens? There are a lot of cats there. Are you trying to set up a cat versus chicken? I don't know. I'm just saying. In Key West. I'm just saying. It could replace the Jake Paul Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if Netflix is interested. There you go. Live, live on Netflix. Cat Chickens versus cats. Great suggestion, Jeffrey Dive. Do it. In Florida, the growing population has been impacting local wildlife, and one rescue organization is on a mission to correct the balance. Christian Benavidez reports from Miami. We really need to make sure that he can paddle appropriately with both feet. At the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station in Miami, Renata Schneider is the emergency veterinarian on duty. We're doing surgeries, we're doing EKG monitoring on our patients, we're using appropriate pain medications, we're cautiously using antibiotics. Founded in 1980, the Seabird Station functions as an ER for local wildlife. Is it an injured animal? Lately, it's gotten busier. We had our highest numbers uh, in, in 2020, 2021. Um, this year has been a very busy year. I don't know if we're going to break those numbers. Staff here says South Florida has an invasive species problem, a growing human population that presents challenges to the native animals. Yorita Costa is in charge of rehabilitation. She's worked here for 12 years. With more people, more buildings going up, um, we see a lot more hit by uh, cars or birds flying into windows or buildings. Then there's the seabirds with fish hook line injuries or that have swallowed plastic waste. The pelicans in this cage have life altering injuries, including this guy that makes them ineligible for release. So the harbor station cares for them. Hey, buddy. 
They become permanent residents at the Wildlife Center, so-called ambassadors, a public face to the Seabird Station during what Schneider says is a critical time. South Florida is in trouble right now. We keep building, we keep destroying habitat. Without our work, how are these pelicans and gulls supposed to continue to thrive? For most of the birds that get treated, this is the goal. After 55 days of treatment for botulism and an eye infection, this brown pelican was successfully released back into the wild. Some people will make the argument, well, they would just die and leave them be in the wild. However, we don't buy into that. Most of the injuries that we see are caused by us. We have to correct the balance. A balancing act to help us coexist responsibly with native wildlife. For CBS Saturday Morning, Cristian Benavides, Miami. Gorgeous okay. birds. And there you go. If you cause the damage to begin with, you exactly. probably play a role in helping to fix it. And to have such passionate volunteers mm -hmm. and staff there, I thought it was really interesting. He talks about an invasive species, mm -hmm. and we are the invasive species. An unusual solution to a neighborhood nuisance. Cristian Benavides shows us how one Florida community is nipping its pesky problem in the bud. <laughs> All right, we could probably fit these two in this truck. In Pinecrest, Florida, a novel approach for a pesky predicament. Is this what you pictured? Uh, no, I did not realize how many there were. <laughs> I mean, how big of a problem. Trapper Blake Wilkins is usually out chasing reptiles. Similar to the iguanas, you know, the, the peacock population has exploded down here. It is <laughs> peacock overdrive. Homeowner Reva Steinman says the beautiful, majestic birds act like they rule the roost. They are an expensive nuisance. Jumping on roofs, pecking at cars, damaging property, even stopping traffic, not to mention the noise. So many complaints, the village decided to act. The humane solution, peacock vasectomies. You know, leave the trap there. Wilkins' team is tasked with trapping the peacocks, food to lure them in, a net to get a handle. Wrangling the peacocks is no easy task, but it's just the first step in the process. Then exotic animal veterinarian Don Harris takes over. If you do a vasectomy on one male, you could stop 7, 10, 15 females from reproducing. Dr. Harris walked us through the process. First, we inject the bird with a sedative. It's basically birdie volume. After 15 minutes, the sleeping bird is ready for the operating room. When we remove that tube, the vas deferens, the bird can no longer fertilize females and their eggs. Then back in the cage, in 20 minutes he awakens. The entire process is less than an hour. The victory behind all this is we are not removing the, the masculinity of the males. They retain their beautiful appearance, they retain their beautiful tail, they retain their dominance. The pilot program has ruffled a few feathers. Some residents feel the birds should be left alone, even stopping some caged peacocks from reaching the operating table. We've had birds humanely enclosed ready for the procedures and people have come in and released them. Still, other cities and towns across the country are calling Dr. Harris, looking to nip and snip their own peacock problem. For CBS Saturday Morning, Cristian Benavides, <coughs> Pinecrest, Florida. Scientists are racing to figure out what's causing strange behavior and even deaths among different types of fish, including endangered sawfish that started in the Florida Keys. As CBS's Christian Benavides explains, there are now reports of this mystery illness in other parts of Florida, including as far north as Tampa. A mystery beneath these crystal blue waters in the Florida Keys is deepening. What's causing fish to act like this, spinning, thrashing until they die? Dr. Michael Crosby with Moat Marine Laboratory is among the researchers diving for clues. No promising lead. Uh, if anything, the mystery just continues to, to expand because um, the report range of this abnormal behavior in fish species is spreading. Initially just in the Keys, Dr. Crosby says while there's been fewer sightings, there are now reports further north and on the Gulf Coast, 
First noticed in the fall of 2023, the abnormal behavior has been reported in over 50 different fish species. Earlier this year, endangered sawfish exhibited symptoms. With a dwindling population, more than 50 are reported to have died from the unidentified illness so far. Biologists believe the actual number of sawfish deaths is higher than what they've been able to confirm. In April, Moat rescued a six sawfish in the Keys. This is where he was kept. Yeah, this is the first stabilization quarantine facility. It was transferred 400 miles away to this facility near Sarasota. There was nothing that stood out in that blood work that would be causing the symptoms. It never gave us an answer of what the actual problem was that caused all of this. Researchers believe the behavior is likely neurological. The sawfish responded to treatment until 21 days later when it didn't. He deteriorated very quickly. It was humanely euthanized. The water is received in bottles. And Researcher really Jennifer helpful. Toyota has been looking at water samples and tissues from other spinning fish. Did anything stand out? So as some other researchers have found, we have also found cyclotoxins in the tissue. Toxins potentially caused by harmful algae on the seafloor is one theory. But there is no definitive answer to why the fish are dying. For CBS Saturday Morning, Cristian Benavides, Key West, Florida. Predator becomes prey in the Florida Everglades as hundreds of hunters descend on the Sunshine State to catch and kill as many Burmese pythons as possible. The snakes are an invasive species that have wreaked havoc on the Everglades ecosystem. But as Christian Benavides found out, while it can feel like a losing battle, biologists aren't giving up just yet. If they're coiled up under this three, four inch of grass right here, yeah. you would never see it. The dead of night provides cover for the many predators lurking in the marshland and swamps of the Florida Everglades. How's it going? Donna Khalil is out hunting the hunters. There's a lot of competition out here. She's among 857 participants from across the country and Canada gotcha. who took part in this year's hunt for the Burmese python a 10-day stretch when anyone can register and train to remove the giant invasive invader. Their reward, $25,000 in cash prices. Does it actually make a difference? Every python removed from the system makes a difference. Mike Kirkland runs the hunt and the Python Elimination Program. It employs 100 year-round hunters, including Khalil. Did it bite you? This is the seventh state-sponsored hunt. But is it a losing battle? Are we winning it right now? Perhaps not, but I'm optimistic about our future. Pythons were imported from Southeast Asia as exotic pets. Officials say owners let them loose in the Everglades when they grew too big, and the python population exploded in the 1990s, ravaging wildlife. The Everglades' native birds, rabbits, raccoons, and deer decimated. Even gators have fallen prey. Almost a complete ecosystem collapse down here. You want to make sure to keep that snake on the ground. Zach Chezhanovsky trains participants on humanely capturing and killing pythons. The scope of this python problem is so big that we can't do this alone. Pythons thrive in warm climate, which is why they've quickly adapted here in the Everglades and they're spreading. Milder winters have led to sightings further north. This USGS map shows the python spread. A Tufts University study found climate change could make the entire continental U.S. hospitable to pythons by 2050. I'm not afraid of that python, but I'm afraid it might get away. So far, over 14,000 pythons have been eradicated, but the big snakes are so successful at adapting to Florida, they appear here to stay. For CBS Saturday Morning, Christian Benavides, The Everglades. You want that assignment, Michelle? You can do the crustaceans I'll and the python. I'll do it. I, I think I can, really? I can handle a python. She's been, Michelle has been I have angling handled, to go on a python. I actually. You, you think you can handle I, a python? I have handled a python. Back up, Chef. I, oh, I'm. Oh, back hold on. up. I, I just backed. I backed. Yeah, no, I can. <laughs> I, 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 when I was in Kenya studying, I, I, I was on, we had to be very careful around snakes. So they trained us how Ooh. to. Like that. Yeah. It was, yeah. Should we set they it have up? black mambas and green mambas, and they're highly poisoned. I'm, oh. I'm glad somebody's dealing with those. I'll stay in the city. Let's go. What if we put a giant python and Michelle <laughs> in a big room? I, Let's do Michelle's going to win. Okay. Let's do it. Well, I, you can, uh, only one way to find out. <laughs>
we begin with a southern delicacy that's in high demand as always, but in short supply this year. It is crawfish season, but you wouldn't know it. The crustaceans are hard to find right now due to a devastating drought that's taking a toll in the bottom of line of thousands of people in Louisiana. CBS's Janet Shamlian goes fishing for answers. <laughs> Those look good. Yeah, they're awesome. Cracking and peeling is serious business in the South this time of year. <laughs> it's crawfish season. The crustacean that looks like a tiny lobster and tastes like a salty combination of shrimp and crab. Hey, crawfish! At the Cajun table in Lafayette, it's busier than usual. Pricier, too. Astronomically more expensive. Yeah. So serious, Cajun Table is one of the few restaurants in the heart of Creole country that has crawfish supply. What's the season like this year? It's very, very slow start. I've never seen the uh, drastic decrease in crawfish like I've seen this year. Sean Swear is the owner of Cajun Table and a lifelong crawfish farmer. Learning from his dad on these 350 acres of crawfish farmland. Harvesting his own fields is the only reason he has crawfish, but not nearly enough. When you're out on the boat, how many sacks are you bringing in now compared to normal this time of year? What we're bringing in now is about seven to eight sacks, and we're running 4,000 cages. So what we normally would be bringing in right now is at least 30 to 40 sacks. Swear says that's less than 20% of his normal haul. You can pick out the old bait, look. Okay. That, throw that in the water. He yeah. took us out on his boat to see what that looks like. Normally, these cages hold dozens of crawfish, but today, there are only a handful. He rebates the cage, hoping for better luck on the next pass. What's causing this? So we had an extreme drought and heat during the summer pretty much a record-breaking drought. One of the driest seasons on record last year means the rice fields used to harvest crawfish didn't get enough rain. Weeks of triple-digit heat sent the crustaceans burrowing deeper into the mud, many unable to emerge. What did the crawfish sell roughly for last summer? Last year at this time, we were selling crawfish for $2.75 a pound. And now? We're selling for $10 a pound. This is the uh, peeling room. Scott Broussard is one of the nation's largest crawfish wholesalers, shipping in a normal year millions of mud bugs. How many people would normally be working in here right now? In this room by itself, about 150 with the support people. His massive plant is at a virtual standstill. Delivery trucks are idle. And this refrigerated room, usually packed with thousands of sacks of crawfish, is down to a few dozen. It's going to hurt our local economy unconditionally. This industry produces over $300 million a year for our local farmers and, and economy here. We're going to be less than 10% of that. There's always a wait in line. Anthony Arsenault has owned Hawks Crawfish for more than four decades. With no crawfish, nobody here, empty parking lot. In years past, the lines to get in were legendary. Hawks is open only in crawfish season, roughly January through June. When will you open this year? Probably not till the end of March, or hopefully, possibly April. What is that doing to your business? Destroying it. On a busy night, some 400 people packed the place, chowing down on 2,000 pounds. If I got every crawfish in the state right now, it wouldn't be enough. Experts say hotter summers will likely continue. Researchers at Louisiana State University are studying the impact of climate change on crawfish production. When do you think you'll really see the kind of supply that you need? I may not see the kind of supply we need until May, June, until the season's over. Okay, crawfish, here we go. Swear says this year, crawfishing feels more like a hobby than a business. <laughs> its costs exceed the catch. It's a lifestyle he loves, and loves to share. You're a good crawfish woman. But love, as they say, doesn't pay the bills. Swear hopes the end of the season will.
hopefully this last few months will account for what we've missed out in the first few. Can that really happen? I've, I'm just remaining hopeful. The rice paddies were a southern staple as harvested. This year, not a field of dreams. Woo! Crawfish! Good one! For CBS Saturday Morning, I'm Janet Shamlian. I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> In Lafayette, Louisiana. Janet really got into it. Historically, crawfish season is like from November to July, and you see that shrink. Huge market for, for crawfish during the month of April, May, late April, early May, and that is Jazz Fest. And that sounds so like they don't even know if they'll have enough. They then. don't know. They have everything. Crawfish, Monica, cr raw crawfish, crawfish bread. There's, there's so much of that huge two-week festival that relies on crawfish. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Love crawfish. So yeah. hope they hope things improve. Yeah, it's, it still is always amazing to me, the effects of climate change that people don't think about. Oh, yeah. And this obviously being one that could shift an entire industry. The cost of veterinary care in the U.S. are up 9% from a year ago. But in parts of the rural West, cost is just one barrier to animal care. The biggest hurdle is finding a veterinarian. A group of volunteers is working to help reduce that barrier to care by taking the vets to the people. Chris Van Cleve has more from the Navajo Nation outside Page, Arizona. Across the Navajo Nation's 27,000 square miles spread over three western states, there is a health care crisis playing out on their rural desert lands. There's an estimated 500,000 dogs and cats, many free roaming, and only about three veterinarians. Thank you guys for coming out and helping our dogs. Volunteers from the Parker Project and Banfield Pet Hospitals across the U.S. make regular trips to the Navajo Nation. Hi, pup. Let's go get some vaccines. Yeah. Going door to door, checking on pets, offering vaccinations, and regular pop-up clinics, providing treatment and helping spay or neuter around 7,500 pets a year. There was a dog we saw this morning, Minnie, who had had a bad interaction with a car tire and that resulted in some damage to one of her eyes. And so I promised her owners that we would clean that eye socket out and make her face happy and beautiful again. Good job. Dr. Katie Howard is a veterinarian volunteer from Chicago who specializes in those types of injuries. She's using her vacation time to help. I saw all kinds of happy young dogs. I saw, you know, adult animals. It's okay. That just needed vaccines, and I saw really gracious, happy to interact with us owners and locals. Nationwide, there are signs of a veterinary shortage. Costs are rising, and some estimates say the U.S. could be up to 24,000 vets short by 2030. For dogs like Ruby, getting veterinary care can be a bit of a challenge up here in northeastern Arizona. There's one vet nearby, but with limited hours, and otherwise, it's a several-hour drive to a veterinarian. They tell us to go to either Flagstaff or St. George, and it's a you know long drive. I don't know if it's worth it, but same time, you know, dogs and cats been you know in your family for so long. They love you, and we love them. So. Iten Red King's family has four dogs and a cat running around their home, checking on Blue. Ouchie! What happened? The medical team spots a potential infection. They can start treating at the weekend's clinic. Every time I hear about this, I would you know take all of our dogs and get them vaccinated. The Banfield Foundation has handed out $19 million in grants over the last seven years to help community groups across the country buy more mobile care units and provide services to animals in need. Good job, bud. Since 2021, $1.3 million has gone to helping pets in Native American communities across 11 states. So far this year, that's meant care for nearly 24,000 animals. If you guys weren't out here doing this, would these dogs and cats get the care they got? I, I don't think so. Lacey Frame is a licensed veterinary tech who manages the foundation's field clinics. She used all of her vacation time last year volunteering. Coming out here, they don't have access to that care. And being able to like use my skills to help make a difference for the pets that wouldn't have gotten care otherwise became very important to me. That difference means pets like Ruby are now checked, fully vaccinated, and ready for a little extra affection. Good job. For CBS Saturday Morning, I'm Chris Van Cleve, outside Page, Arizona. Oh, they are doing such important work, and I can't believe they all do this on their vacation yeah. time. Yeah. Take their vacation yeah. time to do it, yeah. Yeah, it's like, 
you know, vets without borders. How about that? Yeah. Sorry we don't have Dana here to do her dog. Oh, yeah. Aww. Aww. All the, all the good, good boys. boys. All, the, all the good there boys and go. girls. All right.